Father in heaven, I believe I speak for all of us when I can say that the joy that we are experiencing here is really undescribable by the human tongue. I mean, the power of your word, the power that created the worlds, dear Father, we're seeing in the prophecies of the Bible. And I'm just thankful, dear God, that you love us so much that you would reveal these things to us. The Bible is clear that you are not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to a knowledge of the truth. But it's also clear that if the gospel be hid, it be hidden to those who are lost. And you are revealing these things to us because you don't want us to be lost. I thank you for the revealing of your word and just for the role of the Holy Spirit in showing us things to come. And Father, we continue in humble hearts to ask for your spirit. Father, grant us more of your spirit, dear Lord, that we can see these things in clarity, that they might drive us closer to Jesus. We thank you for his death. We thank you for his ministration. We thank you for his prayers on our behalf even now. In his name we pray. Amen. Last night, um, I made an error and we had a discussion. I don't know if all of you were around uh, when we had that error. Uh, you all there, you all saw the error, but you may not have been there in the discussion when it was pointed out to me. Um, so I want to uh, explain the error, I remove it from the record. I don't, I'm, we're going to keep the tape last night, and hopefully those people that watch that tape will get to this tape. But we have been teaching, and this is the rule that was used against me to demonstrate the error. We've been teaching that prophecy is portrayed on a timeline that goes down to the end of the world, like these two timelines going down to the end of the world, and that historical events were set before the people and prophecy was seen to be a figurative delineation of events leading down to the close of this earth's history. And by the way, I'm going fast because I'm going to try to get through some material today. These historical events are waymarks, and I have emphasized over and over again that the different prophetic lines do not necessarily, the lines that line up with each other, they do not necessarily have to have the same number of way marks, but what they do have to have is they have to be in the same sequence. So last night, um, a sister very correctly pointed out that by me including three and a half years after the death of Christ, that three and a half years jumps over the resurrection and ascension, and it throws the the way marks out of sync, and uh, I never have had a burden about that three and a half years anyway. The only reason that I, ever, that I generally say anything about the three and a half years is because I have a trick question when I'm coming up there, and I did it on you, and you fell for it last night. Everybody always does. I says, how long did Jesus give his ministry? And everyone always says three and a half years, and I say, no, he came to confirm the covenant for a week. So three and a half, three and a half. But I realized, and I always say, you know, don't worry, don't stumble over this three and a half. I, I, was, I had no conviction about what it was, but I put it up there. So I'm not going to do that anymore. But I am going to make a defense on some other of the criticism that I, I think was misplaced. And it was probably misplaced just because that first little error um, caused some stumbling. And here's, here's what I want to suggest to you. This is the pattern of Christ, um, a prophetic pattern of Christ. Uh, his preparation time period was 30 years, then he was empowered when he was baptized. And for three and a half years, until the cross, he gave his testimony. And then he was resurrected, then he ascended. And uh, then the fall of Babylon is portrayed in AD 70 and the destruction of Jerusalem. And the second coming of Christ is portrayed in the um, second time that Christ came to this earth at the Isle of Patmos in AD 100, roughly. There is a prophetic line with specific way marks upon it. Upon the testimony of two or three things shall be established. You go to Revelation 11, which is dealing with the Word of God, the Old New Testament, a type of Christ. We don't see the preparation specifically identified in Revelation 11, but we see all the other way marks, and they're in correct sequence, so it doesn't change, and it fits. Okay, This is the second testimony of this particular pattern. Uh, the Old and New Testament are empowered. Uh, three and a half later, they die. Then the resurrection, ascension, uh, ascension uh, fall of Babylon illustrated in a tenth of the city being destroyed. The second coming is encompassed by the third woe. So the, the, the way marks are there. 
they're, they're sound. Um, with the Antichrist power, we see in the history of 508, 538, that there was a preparation time for Antichrist to be set up. He was set up and empowered, 538, gave its testimony for three and a half years, received a deadly wound. Uh, prophecy tells of restoration of his power, the resurrection, and then ascending to the throne of the earth, um, and then falling completely and fully, leading to the second coming of Christ. The way marks are there, they're sound. It's not a problem. Uh, and then I point to uh, the preparation time period of the Millerite movement, empowered in 1840, um, when Christ came down out of heaven with the little book open, um, October 22nd, 1844, um, is symbolically a type of death. What we're looking forward to is a revival. That's our first work, um, our greatest need. And then uh, in the latter rain time period when we are in full revival, we are going to be lifted up before all the world as the final warning message as we reflect Christ's character to a dying world while probation is still open and then probation closes, seven last plagues, and Christ comes. The way marks are there. So now let me show you something out from another pattern that I intended to deal with at the, pre the end of this prophecy school towards the end, and we still will deal with it. But in the Bible... There's a pattern, which I call the 3-1 combination, that's, that's shown throughout the Bible, and you bring it down to the end of the world, and it fits. And there are, you know, probably 20 of these combinations in the Bible. I can't say that I've recognized them all, but there are many, many. Um, Jesus says that both the days of Noah and the days of Lot are illustrating the end of the world. And Noah and his three sons, and Lot and the three heavenly vi visitors are representing the three angels' messages that came into history in the 1844 time period, and we're waiting for the fourth angel's message. They're a very simplistic symbolization of the three angels' message followed by the fourth. Now, what, from my understanding, what the testimony of Lot and Noah is teaching about the three angels' message followed by the fourth is the condition of the world, because the story of the days of Noah and the story of Lot is telling about the, the cultural condition of the world at the time period that the three angels message comes into history followed by the loud cry message. Uh, Job and his three friends are telling about the end of the world but they're emphasizing the experience of God's people at the end of the world when every earthly support is cut off. That's how I understand it. It's, just, it's another 3-1 combination I'm um, telling a different aspect of the end of the world in connection with, with the third angel's message followed by the fourth. A classic one, of course, is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego getting thrown into the fiery furnace, which Sister White in 11 places says is a Sunday law. And once in the fiery furnace, a fourth appears. Now, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego isn't necessarily telling how every earthly support is cut off, although being thrown into a fiery furnace is close to that. And it's, it's not necessarily telling the condition of the world, but from my study, the story of Daniel 3 is telling about how the message gets carried to the world. The whole world was represented there at that test, and when they see the four people in the fiery furnace, the message went to the world. This is, this is a 3-1 combination that is teaching the lesson primarily of how the message is carried to the world. Now, there are, there are many other 3-1 combinations that are very simple like the ones we just went over, but there are other ones that begin to build more information. For instance, um, when, when you look at these messages very carefully, you'll find that these first messages, uh, the first one is a reform message. The second one is a message of revival, and the third one is judgment. Now, I know that I'm not proving this. This is later on, but I want to make a point. When you bring this 3-1 combination together at the end of the world, you can establish certain characteristics about these messages that allows you to build a fuller picture. And for, as an example, in the days of Moses, Moses brought a message of reform. What was Moses' message of reform that he brought to the children of Israel? Sabbath reform. They weren't keeping the Sabbath. And he came and he brought a message of Sabbath reform and they began keeping the Sabbath. And it so infuriated Pharaoh that what did he do? He says, double the amount of bricks they're making. And then there's a mighty movement of the Holy Spirit. This is the revival time period symbolized in the outpouring of the plagues. This, is, this isn't a, an, uh, a, the power of men. This is the power of God. This is the second angel's message symbolized in the plagues. 
And then the third angel's message is symbolized. It's judgment in the judgment of the firstborn. And that's why when you're lining this up with the three angels' messages at the end of the world and we're waiting for the fourth, that Sister White compares this Passover time period with 1844 because she uses the history immediately after the judgment of Passover in Egypt to, to identify a disappointment that took place between the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army. Now, there's, there's more information that comes in here as you develop these. I'm not going to deal with that right now. One of the pieces of information that you establish is that before a first message, there's always darkness, then a reform message, then revival, then judgment, followed by a disappointment. God's people are given a work. God's people go into backsliding. You can establish these from these different history. And then the fourth angel's message arrives in history. So what am I saying? Here's what I'm saying. We have read from early writings, page 259 in this presentation earlier, that Sister White compares the first, second, third angel's message with Jesus' time period and fourth angel's message. She compares John the Baptist and William Miller. William Miller brought the first angel's message. He was a type of John the Baptist. Um, and Sister White compares the second angel's message, the midnight cry, anyone? To the triumphal entry into Jerusalem just before Jesus was crucified and the cross is lined up with, the, with October 22nd, 1844, and immediately after the cross, we have a disappointment. Uh, the church is given a work to do. Back, backslidden condition, condition is symbolically illustrated with the disciples putting away their sins just before Pentecost. Now, here's my point, and then I'll try to bring this to a conclusion. In some of these 3-1 combinations, you have just the, the rough the rough outline, okay? But in some of them, you have dates. Um, what In Moses' time, what is the, the fourth message symbolized in the story of Moses? The first message is the message of reform that Moses brought after a period of darkness. The children of Israel are in Egypt. The second message, a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the plagues. The third message, the judgment of the firstborn in Egypt and disappointment at the Red Sea. But in the story of Moses, what is the the event that points forward to the latter rain at the end of the world, because the fourth angel's message is the latter rain. What's the event? Nope. Pentecost. Brothers and sisters, Pentecost is established here on Sinai. And Pentecost points forward to what? The Pentecost of Christ's day and age. And Pentecost is the history that Sister White uses to illustrate the latter rain, right? Do you all follow that? Why is it called Pentecost? Why is it called Pentecost? <laughs> because it took place 50 days after Passover. Pentecost means 50 days. See, we have a time period from here to here, 50 days. Now, if you bring this history of Moses down to the time period of the cross, you have darkness before John the Baptist. John the Baptist being, brings a message of reform. Then we have the triumphal entry. And what did Jesus say? If these children's if these children don't cry out, the very rocks will cry out. This was a mighty movement of the Holy Spirit. And if no one had been there to usher Christ into Jerusalem, the very rocks would have ushered him in. This was a movement of the Holy Spirit. And judgment came at the cross, the disappointment of the disciples. And then what, what symbolizes the latter rain, the fourth message in the time of Jesus? Pentecost. And did it have a time element connected to it? Fifty days. It was exactly like Moses. Okay? So... If we bring this down to the end of the world, we have a time element. When's the first angel message? 1840. When's the second angel's message? 42. When's the third angel's message? 44. Has it been 50 days or even 50 years since 1844? Much longer, but the fourth angel's message hasn't come. So the fact that in some of these illustrations that there is a time element that, is, that the Lord intends us to understand does not destroy the other illustrations that the time element isn't there or is a little bit different. It's okay. That, upon the testimony of two or three, I think, shall be established. So if we, if we understand that, that the 50 days that is twice established in this pattern in the time period of Moses and in the time period of Christ. There's another time period, by the way. At the beginning of the 2300 days, you have three decrees, okay? And what is the fourth message symbolized in that time period? Nehemiah rebuilding and restoring Jerusalem. Do we have a time period between them coming out of Babylon and rebuilding Jerusalem that's identified in Scripture? 
Yes, we do. It's in the 2300-day prophecy, and right off the top of my head, I don't remember it, but someone in here should. How many years did it take to rebuild and restore Jerusalem? 49 years. 49 years. But that isn't 50 days. But it doesn't deny the pattern. Okay, we weren't, we weren't challenging the way marks. We were allowing the Lord to teach us different aspects from these histories that we can safely align at the end of the world. So, what am I saying? I'm saying that when we come to the pattern of Christ and we look at the pattern of Christ in the, the Advent movement to begin, if you've, I, I don't know that we can start the preparation in 1833. I, I have no inspired source for that. I put it at 1833 because of the falling of stars and William Miller being ordained. I'm not holding that dogmatically, but I'm saying that there's definitely a preparation of the Millerite movement that leads up to the empowerment in 1840 and the great disappointment in 1844. So 40 to 44, you know, three and a half, four years, if you want to get into the months of it. Uh, we're and waiting for the resurrection a long time. But when it comes to the pattern of Christ and Antichrist, Jesus is trying to teach us something very specific. And he says, Jesus was 30 years in preparation, and so was Antichrist. He wants us to understand that. One of the reasons he wants to, us to understand that is because he wants to, uh, us to understand, believe it or not, that the daily understanding of the pioneers was spot on. That 508 was a, a date in history that God's people, God's students of prophecy at the end of the world, need to understand it's valid. And 30 years later, in 538, the papacy was empowered, and for 1260 years, or three and a half prophetic years, just like Christ, the papacy gave its testimony, and then it received its deadly wound. So, all I'm saying is, is that I know that after I made the, the blow it on worrying about inserting the three and a half years after the cross, that I, it caused some people to shake, and I'm sorry for that. I'm retracting that, but in these different patterns, the fact that some of them do not have any time element at all, and some of them we know the time element from history, but some of them we have specific histories. The, the, the light that has been revealed is for us and our children forever. We need to, to hold this pattern because it's not only confirming the daily, it's confirming that the message in the Bible for the hour is Daniel 11, 40 to 45, and all the way on through Daniel 12, 3, is illustrating the last movements of the Antichrist power, and it's also the very message designed to bring the revival to God's people and allow them to partake in being lifted up and giving this final warning message. The three Elijahs. Will those who have the charge of the flock of God awaken to their duty? Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. When the church is properly, properly instructed, there will not be so great dependence and weakness. Believers in the truth will not come and go as the door upon its hinges. They will not sit complacently and listen to sermon after sermon and fail to bring the instruction into practical life. Many a minister does present the truth with force and clearness, but the members of the church fail to reap benefit therefrom because the word is not mixed with faith in them that hear it. The mind is occupied with worldly interest, and as soon as they leave the church door, the impression is lost, for as water flows from a leaky vessel, so the truth leaks from the heart. The more preaching they have, the less they do to carry out the truth in practical godliness. They are glutted with sermons, and the truth fails to arouse them to the sense of their condition. It is important that the people understand that they cannot depend upon a minister or expect that one will be stationed among them to do all the work in their community. Were this done, it would result in spiritual death to those who are content to look on while other, another bears the burden. Let the people understand that it is by diffusing their light that they will have light more abundantly. But if they fail to impart light, they will lose even that which they have and will walk in darkness. I haven't said it enough in this prophecy school, 
let me say it again. You shouldn't believe anything that I've said or Russell. You should take what we've said and test it to the Word of God through prayer and your own personal study. Let's look at Elijah. And the reason we're going to look at Elijah is because I believe that the story of Elijah portrays the end of the world. And I believe that the story of Elijah is a very classic triple application of prophecy. Elijah the first was Elijah. Elijah the second was John the Baptist. And both of them point forward to God's people, the 144,000 at the end of the world. And both, all three, Elijah, John the Baptist, and the 144,000 have to struggle against a three-fold power at the end of the world. 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 17 through 22. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, there's one of his uh, opponents, that Ahab said unto him, Are thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, there's another enemy, 450, and the prophets of the grove, 400, which eat, which eat at Jezebel's table, enemy number three. And uh, this is, we know this is a present true story because of what Malachi says, but remember, we were being instructed this morning that definitely the influence of Balaam, uh, he is the one that designed the plan of attack of the Moabitish women. Um, he impacts God's people here at the end, so this is a story for the end. We need to understand Balaam and Moab and Midian. Continuing on, so Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mar Mount Carmel. Uh, Mount Carmel, a type of 1840 to 1844, a type of what's going on right here and now as the angel comes down with the little big book open. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. First Kings 19, 1 through 3. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. This is after the battle at Carmel. And with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. Malachi 4.5 Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the world with a curse. Now this, this is well after Elijah. This is a promise that Elijah would come again before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And in Bible prophecy, the great and dreadful day of the Lord is at the end of the world. The great day of the Lord was when Christ came the first time, but the great and dreadful day of the Lord is at the end of the world. Uh, nevertheless, the Jews were expecting Elijah in their time period, and uh, sure enough, he did appear. Luke 7, 24 through 28. And when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. What went ye out into the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in king's courts. But what went you out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I send to you, and much more than a prophet. This is he, this is Jesus speaking, this is he of whom it is written, this is he of whom it is written in Malachi, where we just read, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the, thy way before thee. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Jesus identifies John the Baptist as the Elijah that comes before the day of the Lord. Here's John the Baptist's story. Matthew 14, that we're going to deal with. Matthew 14, 3 through 11. For Herod laid, had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. For John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. 
And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was kept, when Herod's birthday was kept, keep that in your mind, please. That's an interesting little tidbit. When Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod, whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. And he said before he had, he, and she, being before instructed of her mother, said, give me here John the Baptist's head in a charger. And the king was sorry, nevertheless, for the oath's sake. And them which sat with him at meat, he commanded it to be given her. And he sent and beheaded John in the prison. And his head was brought in the charger and given to the damsel. And she brought it in to her mother. Here are some of the, the, the parallels between Elijah the first and Elijah the second. Ahab could not catch Elijah. Um, For Herod laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother's wife, to have her. See, Ahab could not catch Elijah, but John the Baptist was caught. One goes to jail, one doesn't go to jail. It's the same same way, Mark, but it's a little bit reversed. It's, It's given more information by contrasting the same way, Marks. Elijah and John the Baptist are a way, Mark, of God's people at the end of the world. Notice the message of both of them. Your house is the troubler. There's Elijah. And uh, in John the Baptist, it was that you were, are not to be married to your brother's wife. Same message. Same message. That's the problem, is you. It was a public event on Mount Carmel in Elijah's story. Um, in John the Baptist's story, a public event, Herod's birthday. Um, the third player, um, Jezebel and Herodias are the woman in both the stories, Ahab and Herod are the men, and then the son of, or the daughter of Herodias, and the priest of Baal are the entities that do the dance of deception. And uh, the prophets of Baal danced, and Salome danced. We see with Ahab and Herod um, a civil power illustrated. Daniel chapter 2, Daniel speaking to um, Nebuchadnezzar, Thou, O king, are this head of gold. A king is a kingdom. It's a geopolitical power. It's a civil power. Herod and Ahab are representing civil authority. And we have in both stories, we have this civil authority that is not supposed to be married to the women they're married to. Ahab wasn't supposed to be married to Jezebel. Why? Because Ahab was an Israelite and Jezebel wasn't. Um, it was an unlawful marriage of a, to an impure woman. Was Herod supposed to be married to Herodias? No. So we have corrupt women here. And what's a corrupt woman? A false church. And then we have a third power that does a dance of <coughs> deception. Uh, King Herod, Ahab, civil authority. Uh, There is an oath made uh, between the civil authority and the one that does the dance of the deception. Both, uh, uh, one thing to be noted, or several things to be noted, that in the story, where was Jezebel at Carmel? She was behind the scenes. At uh, Herod's birthday party, where was Herodias? Behind the scenes. So these women are behind the scenes, but who are they directing? Who does Bible prophecy point out that they are directing? They're directing the power that does the dance of deception. The priests of Baal were under the control of Jezebel. Salome was under control of Herodias. Now, if we're going to bring this down to the end of the world... And it's which is easy to do. The false church at the end of the world is the beast. It's the papacy, correct? That's easy to see. And so we're saying that at the end of time, as these threefold powers are leading the world to Armageddon, where is the papacy going to be in relation to these other two powers? It's going to be pulling the strings from behind the scenes, right? But also, the papacy is going to be directly controlling this entity, the one that does the dance of deception. Correct? So there, this relationship is being established in the story of Elijah. 
Also, this woman is going to be, become, come into an unlawful relationship with the civil power, the dragon, right? That's what we're learning from this. We're learning that the purpose, of, what's the purpose of Jezebel and Herodias? What is the burden on their heart? To do away, to deal, do away with Elijah and John the Baptist, the 144,000. And who do Eli Elijah and John the Baptist are the, representing the same people at the end of the world? Who are they representing? God's people. But they're showing two classes of God's people at the end of the world. Who are they, who are they symbolizing? The martyrs and those that do not taste death. So in the story, we're seeing the whole, the whole picture portrayed for us. Um, one thing that I want to emphasize here is that we're told... Um, when the kingdom, uh, well, we're told there's a point in time in a public event where Herod um, gives, lets Salome do the dance of deception, that it's his birthday. What is your birthday? It's the day you were born. Keep that in mind, because there comes a time, we're going to show, where the civil power, the dragon at the end of the world, is the seventh kingdom of Revelation 17, which in Revelation 17, five have fallen, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, paper Rome. One is the United States. The seventh king is this civil power. And when the seventh kingdom is born, on its birthday, it's going to strike an agreement, according to Revelation 17. And what is the agreement? Its agreement is to co-rule with the woman. It's going to agree to give its kingdom unto the beast for one hour or a short space, right at the end of time. It takes place... At the birthday, there's an agreement struck. It says these ten kings agree to give their kingdom unto the beast. Um, and this agreement is going to be a threefold agreement. And the agreement is going to place the beast of Catholicism setting on top of this threefold agreement takes place at his birthday when the United States forces the world to submit to a new world order. The desire of Jezebel is the desire to... Um, Deal with heretics. Now, we're, going to, we're moving into some of this history in a moment, but brothers and sisters, there was a time in history when the papacy was given the authority to deal with, history, with heretics. When was that? 533. 533, the papacy's allowed to deal with heretics. When Justinian, who was Justinian? The civil power was turned over to the papacy in 533 to allow them to deal with heretics when she became the head of the churches. Um, there was a time period when power was given to the papacy that we're going to deal with. When was power given to the papacy? Military power, 496 to 508 and onward. And uh, the authority, authority took place over here. But she is seated in power 538, she'll be seated. She was given the seat, 330, sorry. All these um, historical elements line up with these three powers. Now, let me see what I passed over in my notes as we move forward. For Herod had laid hold of John, bound him. One uh, was arrested, one wasn't. Uh, the issue was fornication. Uh, the fact that uh, Elijah tells Ahab, it's your house that's the trouble of, troubler of, Is of Israel. And John the Baptist confronted Herod about his unlawful major, uh, marriage. What's that telling us? It's telling us the message of the hour at the end of time has to do with the unlawful relationship between the beast, the dragon, and also the false prophet. But it's the unlawful relationship that Bible prophecy identifies as the combination of church and state. And sure enough, that is the third angel's message that's illustrated um, by Elijah and John. And Elijah and John represent those that are defenders of religious liberty, but they're going to be persecuted by Jezebel. Uh, when Herod, Ahab, the civil authority, or the United Nations' birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias, the daughters of Rome, priests of Baal, the Protestants of the United States, or the false prophet, danced before them and, please, deceived Herod, Ahab, the civil authority, the United Nations, or the dragon power. Brothers and sisters, there's a deception coming. Let me explain what I mean. The United States, we know, is the false prophet. 
the, we know from Revelation 13, the United States is the power that deceives the whole world. And it is going to deceive the world uh, in the sense that it's going to force the world to accept a new world order. And the structure of the new world order is going to be that there's going to be a civil power that agrees to rule for a short space with a moral authority placed over it. And the deception comes. The deception uh, that takes place in both, in both stories, there's a deception. When, when Elijah ran back, or rode back from Carmel, Elijah ran in front of Ahab's um, carriage and came back from Carmel, and Ahab comes into Jezebel and he says, you would not believe what took place at Carmel. Uh, the, the Lord God demonstrated that he is the God and Baal isn't the God. He was thinking that Jezebel was going to be converted on the spot. Was she? No. no. So I want Elijah's head off. See, Ahab wasn't expecting that. Uh, was Herod expecting that Salome was going to say, I want John the Baptist's head in a charger? No way. No way. See, the civil power at the end the, the civil structure around the whole world, it's going to be deceived and it's going to realize its deception on Herod's birthday. When this agreement struck to set up a, a new world order with the papacy in the moral authority, seat of authority over the whole arrangement, it's at that point that the civil authority that it's ruling over is going to realize it's going to be deceived. And why is it going to realize it's going to be, be deceived? Very simply, uh, very straightly, because when you go back into these histories that are so important in the pioneer writings, 508, 330, and 533, you find out that the place where the authority was turned over to the papacy was 533 when Justinian turned the authority of Rome over to the papacy, and he did so in the midst of a religious crisis. He wanted to settle the argument that was raging in Rome. Is the church in Rome the preeminent church or the church in Constantinople the preeminent church? A religious crisis that a political figure steps into to solve. He was doing it for his own political expediency because the trumpet powers were coming down and taking his kingdom apart. And he thought it was better if he got the church on Rome, church of Rome in his corner than the church of Constantinople. But nevertheless, it was a religious crisis that he stepped into, and in stepping into it, he identified the Pope of Rome as the corrector of heretics, and at the end of the world, there is going to be a religious crisis that's brought up on the world that's going to bring the world to its knees, and the United States is going to do its dance of deception and insist that the world submit to a new world, one world government, but the world's not going to do it because this, this one world order, nobody has confidence in. United Nations doesn't do anything. The only reason they voted the way they did for Iraq because Saddam Hussein was paying them all off. And everybody knows it. It's out there. Everyone may not know it, but it's public record. Then it, it, even if it wasn't for that, they sit around and they, they talk, but they never get anything done. So the world's not going to want to be directly under the control of the United Nations. And the world definitely doesn't want to be under control of George Bush. Uh, you know, like someone here was telling me the other day in Europe, they think George Bush is one of the dumbest people there ever has been. Now, I don't believe that. I think he's a pretty shrewd individual. Uh, if you're really shrewd, you keep people thinking you're not really shrewd sometimes. I think that's where he may be. He's the power that does the dance of deception. But nevertheless, this power is going to deceive the world to accept this power, but only under the condition that it has a moral authority that everyone can trust. And the greatest moral leader in the world today is this power. And the world is going to be, de be deceived to think that once again, this power is going to be the moral answer to, to solve a religious crisis. And what's the religious crisis? Because it's already here. It's called radical Islam. And as soon as this structure is put in place, this power is going to be deceived because it's going to realize that Jezebel wasn't worried about radical Islam. Jezebel was worried about Seventh-day Adventists. But it's too late. That's what's coming down the line as illustrated in the three powers of Bible prophecy that are modern Babylon as illustrated in Elijah, John the Baptist, and the 144,000. That story being what it is, as a prophetic rule, just as a prophetic principle, I want to remind you that Elijah and John the Baptist are the first two times that this triple application of prophecy has come to pass. And the first two times that a triple application of prophecy comes to pass establishes the characteristics of when the third comes to pass. 
And that's worth understanding because we're moving towards our study on the three woes. You want to understand the third woe? Understand the first two woes. Let me see what I forgot here. Jezebel, Ahab, and the priest of Baal, Herodias, Herod, and Salome, the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet, the seat, the authority, the power, Edom, Moab, and the children of Ammon, Sambalat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arabian, Moab, Midian, and Balaam from the land of the children of his people, Hebrew, Latin, and Greeks. This is this board over here, brothers and sisters. Modern Babylon is por portrayed throughout Bible prophecy. Upon the testimony of two or three, things shall be established. It's when we bring these testimonies together that light begins to increase. Now, this... This story about modern Babylon in the story of Elijah is not, not necessarily, not fully telling us how the world gets led to Armageddon. It's not telling us um, where God's other children in Babylon are, get called out of. It's not breaking up uh, the world into the enemies of God as in the story of the cross, that all of us are enemies of cross that are getting reconciled to, cro to Christ at the cross. It's not telling that story about modern Babylon. Um, it, it's telling the story of the very dynamics of the powers that will actually be struggling against one another here at the end of the world. And brothers and sisters, it's underway. The struggle's already underway. Power, seat, and authority, Revelation 13.2, is a type of the three enemies of Bible prophecy. While the Protestant world is making concessions to Rome and danger is increasing on every hand, let us arouse to comprehend the sit situation and to see the contest before us in its true bearings. Let the watchman lift up the voice and give with clearness the message which is present truth for this time. Now notice, this is a place where she's going to tell us what the message of present truth for this time is. For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? Let us show the people where we are in prophetic history. There's the prophetic, the present truth message for the hour. Show the people where we are in prophetic history. Why? Because at the end of the world, God's people are always portrayed as being asleep. And we need to be awakened to the situation that's going on in the world, and per primarily we be, need to be awakened to the fact that we're not ready for that situation. And if we don't prepare our character for the seal of God, when the test of the Sunday law arrives, we're lost. And, and there's somehow, some way, there's some dynamic that has been designed by Jesus that through showing the people where we are in prophetic history, through establishing it from the Word of God, and then confirming it from the events that are going on around us. There's some dynamic there that Jesus designed that allows the Holy Spirit to take us and shake us and say, the end is here. Wake up. Amen. That's the purpose of Bible prophecy. And if we will wake up, then the Lord is fully willing to empower us with His Holy Spirit to fully grow up into Him and represent him fully in this crisis time. But if we will not wake up, we will call this light darkness and fight against it. That's what it, fight against it. That's what inspiration says. We're in a time period now where uh, we don't have a choice. We don't have a choice. Why halt we between two opinions? And the people answered, not a word. Brothers and sisters, that, this is the question here today. Why halt we between two opinions? Is this light or is this darkness? That's the question. Let us show the people where we are in prophetic history and seek to arouse the spirit of true Protestantism, awakening the world to a sense of the value of religious liberty they have so long enjoyed. What is true Protestantism? It's that every one of us in this room can have a personal experience with Jesus Christ on our own. Not only that we can, but we must. That's Protestantism. That's Protestantism. In these times of special interest, the guardians of the flock of God should teach the people that the spiritual powers are in controversy. Brothers and sisters, you can only rightly understand the role of the beast, the dragon, the false prophet, the United States, the United Nations, and the papacy is if you understand that they are in controversy with one another. They're in controversy. And all you have to do is look in the world. They're in controversy. The United States isn't walking with the United Nations. 
And the United States is walking with the papacy, but the United States doesn't realize the papacy isn't keeping the best interests of the United States front and center. It's deceiving the United States. I mean, they're in controversy. They're struggling. They're struggling against one another. That's what Sister White says. In these times, the guardians of the lock of God should teach the people that the spiritual powers are in controversy. It is not human beings that are creating such intensity of feeling as now exists in the religious world. A power from Satan's spiritual synagogue is infusing the religious elements of the world, arousing men to decided action to press the advantages Satan has gained. Did you hear George Bush after he was elected? The next day, what, what did he say? He says, I won political capital with this election and I'm going to spend it. That's what he said. That's almost word for word. What's that mean? It means... The power from Satan's spiritual synagogue is infusing the religious elements of the world, arousing men to decided action to press the advantages Satan has gained. He's going to press forward, brothers and sisters. He's going to press forward. And he's told us what his agenda is. He's already told us. By leading the religious world to determine, determine warfare against those who make the word of God their guide and the sole foundation of doctrine. It's right ahead of us. The Bible is its own expositor. Scripture is to be compared with Scripture. The student should learn to view the world, the Word as a whole and see the relationship of its parts. He should gain a knowledge of the grand central theme of God's original purpose for the world, the rise of the great controversy, and the work of redemption. He should understand the nature of two principles that are contending for supremacy and should learn to trace their working through the records of history and prophecy to the great consummation. We've read this quote a few times in our study, the last sentence here from Great Controversy 438. Thus, while the dragon primarily represents Satan, it is, in a secondary sense, a symbol of Rome. There is more than one meaning to prophetic symbols. And in Revelation 13, 2, we referred to this a great deal. The dragon, pagan Rome, gave three things to the papacy. It removed three things for the papacy. It removed the three horns, but it gave its power, seat, and authority. The Great Controversy, page 54. In the 6th century, the papacy had become firmly established. Its seat of power was fixed in the imperial city. When was its seat of power fixed? The year 330. Pagan Rome gave its seat of power to papal Rome in the sense that it moved from the city of Rome to Constantinople, leaving a vacuum in the city of Rome for the Vatican to fill. And the Bishop of Rome was declared to be the head over the entire church. There's 533. Paganism had given place to the papacy. The dragon had given the beast his power, his seat, and his great authority. And now began the 1260 years of papal oppression foretold in the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. Power. Daniel 8, 21 and 2. And the rough goat is the king of Grestia, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king, Alexander the Great. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall, sta shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. What was the power of Alexander the Great? His military power. Power, Bible prophecy. Military power. Authority. The speaking of a nation is the action of its legislative and judicial authority. Authority in Bible prophecy? Civil authority. Justinian turned over his civil authority to the papacy in the year 533. Now, the, the papacy didn't get to exercise it for another five years, but it was given, it, given to it in that year. The dragon at the end of the world. We have to spend some time on this, on uh, the different, the beast, dragon, and false prophet. And uh, one of the things that we're going to share about the dragon that is, that is worth understanding. Brothers and sisters, when it comes to the daily in the book of Daniel, uh, Daniel chose a word that came from the sanctuary when he first introduced the word daily because he was in Daniel 8 and he wanted to emphasize that Daniel 8 is dealing with the religious aspect of these kingdoms of Bible prophecy. So Daniel 8 is pervaded with sanctuary terminology. The daily is a word that comes out of the sanctuary and it means... It is continual, it's translated as daily, and it's used in the sanctuary as the continual burnt offering. Uh, this is part of the reason that people that stumble over the false view sometimes stumble over it. But in the book of Daniel, uh, and if you read very closely William Miller, we read it, but you may not have caught it. I just now thought of it, and I didn't emphasize it when we read it. When we read William Miller's statement on, on uh, why he came to understand the daily is paganism, in that paragraph he says, 
I found no other place in the scripture where the daily, and I forget exactly how I said it, was, was, was located. He, he, what he was saying is that he found no place in the scriptures where continual was. But, but continual was all over the scriptures. But what, he was making a very, uh, very good point because the other places in the scriptures where there's lots, where it's the continual, it's always used as a, an adjective or an adverb, and I'm, I know I'm not saying that right, because like I say, uh, I'm real bad on languages. But the difference is, in the book of Daniel, the daily is a noun. It's a subject, and it's only that way in the book of Daniel. William Miller recognized that. that as the way the daily is used in the book of Daniel, William Miller saw it was totally different than how it's used in the rest of the Bible, and he said so, and it is. And what, what we and William Miller identify the daily is, is paganism, and Daniel chose the word continual because he was identifying the dragon power and the dragon power of the dragon beast and false prophet. One of his characteristics, the dragon power, is it's the power that has been opposing God's people from the Tower of Babel all the way through to the end of the world. It's the power that continually opposes God and his people. But at the end of the world, the dragon power is different than the dragon power at the Tower of Babel. It's different than the dragon power in Pergamos. Why did I say the dragon power in Pergamos? Because that's where the Satan's seat was in Pergamos. See, the dragon power moved from the Tower of Babel to Babylon to Pergamos. And then when pagan Rome conquered Pergamos, what did it do with the, with the Chaldeans that were living in Pergamos? It took the Chaldean religions and the Chaldean priests and it moved them to the city of Rome and gave them a place where? In the temple we call the Pantheon. The dragon power moves through history. It begins at the Tower of Babel, goes to Babylon, goes to Pergamos, goes to the city of Rome. It spreads out to uh, the ten kingdoms of Rome, later to be the seven European kings, and then especially France, and then the Soviet Union, and then the United Nations. The dragon power moves through history, whereas the, the beast power, it's always in Rome. city of Rome stays there the whole time, all, from beginning to end. The false prophet is the United States of America from beginning to end. But the dragon power, the characteristic of the dragon power is it moves through history. It moves, it pops its head up at different places in history. And if you ask Seventh-day Adventists, what does the dragon symbolize? They'll usually tell you spiritualism. But this quote isn't dealing with the spiritual aspect of the dragon power. It's dealing with the political aspect of the dragon power. And each of those powers have a spiritual and political aspect. And it says this. In the scenes represented the work of Christ for us and the determined accusation of Satan against us, Joshua stands as the high priest. Kings and rulers and governors have placed upon themselves the brand of Antichrist and are represented as the dragon. Notice, a plurality of political leaders, like ten kings in Revelation 17, are the dragon power who goes to make war with the saints and with those who keep the commandments of God. This is the Sunday law time period. In their enmity against God, they show themselves guilty also of the choice of Barabbas. When does Barabbas come into history again? Immediately after the Sunday law, Satan appears in Sister White, compares Barabbas with Satan personating Christ. Okay, so this, these kings, governors, and rulers that Sister White is dealing with, she's placing them specifically in the Sunday Law time period, and she's associating them with Satan personating Christ, because Satan personating Christ has been illustrated by, by Barabbas, Bar meaning son of, Abba meaning father. Barabbas was a false Christ. And who is Satan in Bible prophecy? He's the dragon. And the dragon power at the end of the world is not the ten European kingdoms, which really aren't ten anymore. At best, they're seven. It's kings, governors, and rulers that encompass the whole world at the end of time, in the time period of the Sunday Law, when the history of Barabbas is being repeated. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day of life and a time to live such as this when you're willing to open up your word to us, but it's a very solemn time because we have the possibility to receive it as light or reject it as darkness. It's a time where we can't afford to be like those 
of your people back there in Carmel, Carmel that just answered not a word. Lord, we need help to uh, know which way should we should go with this material. I ask that you would give us a, a burden upon our heart that will not let us uh, go until we come to understand if what we're hearing this week is true or false. And if it's true, Lord, we thank you for being so merciful uh, to us to let us see this light at this time. And help us uh, be a tool in your hand, as we've said before, to go out and uh, do what you want with us, with those around us. Please continue to abide with us. Send us your Holy Spirit and angels throughout this day. Help us get the things um, set in order that we need to have set in order before Sabbath. And uh, as there are a few more people coming this weekend, we ask um, that you give them traveling mercies as well and continue to be with our families at home as they prepare for the Sabbath. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.